other time a Christian theologian, and which means that I see my task as seeking to articulate as faithfully and cogently as possible the nature of God's self-disclosure um, to the world, most fully in the person of Jesus Christ, and, the, um, and what precisely was going on with that, the extent to which what it means to suggest that God was in Christ reconciling an alienated world to himself. So that, so that is the focus of my task. So my first book was entitled Persons in Communion and was seeking to articulate the implications of that for theological description, for the conditions of the recognition of this event and its implications for how we conceive of God, the nature of God and God's purposes, and also the nature of persons. So, um, so that raises the question as to what um, philosophical theology or philosophy religion might have to offer my discipline and um, what I do. Well, um, I'm in the privileged position of having studied philosophy 40 years ago and therefore having witnessed an, a quite remarkable sea change <laughs> in the whole field um, of, of analytic philosophy, um, largely under the influence of Alvin Plantinga. And there is, I mean, on 40 years ago, you could count on the fingers of a mutilated hand the number of non-closet Christian analytic philosophers. Now there are thousands, mm -hmm. and as a result, we've got spectacular resources covering almost every, every kind of topic that is thrown up um, by Christian theology, relating to epistemology, metaphysics, um, nature, of the per nature of the person, nature, you know, free will or um, um, compatibilism issues, um, and so on. And these resources are extraordinarily useful for understanding justification and warrant for Christian belief, and, but also for taking on some of the challenges that we have to um, Christians confront. Mm -hmm. For example, metaphysical naturalism, all sorts of confused suppositions vis-a-vis -vis, um, religious pluralism, and so on. And so the resources um, of, um, say, the work that Mike, Mike Ray, Al Pandigas on, on metaphysical naturalism, um, Peter Van Inmagen's um, extraordinary contribution to the field, um, these are an enormously fertile um, these are enormously fertile resources which massively contribute to the task that I see to be um, articulating Christian theology and called self-disclosure in cogent, coherent ways. Do you think you would be engaging philosophical resources in the same way that you do now if not for the sea change in analytic philosophy? Great question. The sea change in analytic philosophy meant that there were resources that were much more useful mm. than they would otherwise have been. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, um, so there's um, extremely able folk have thought hard about problem, problem you know, horrendous evil, for example, mm -hmm. um, epistemological issues, with, a, with an eye to the challenges that Christian thought has to face. Mm -hmm. um, and so that is why those resources are so useful. Mm. Um, when I studied philosophy, a lot of it was history of ideas, right. and that those resources were useful, um, but they didn't cast nearly as much constructive light mm -hmm. on the dis my distinctive um, calling mm -hmm. as um, mm -hmm. you know, as you do now. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's just all benefits? So I agree with you that uh, this sea change did have, I mean, it did mean a lot of positive change for philosophy, for religion, but. So one of the things that went a bit off the table was looking at religion as a cultural phenomenon. And I agree, agree with you that, you know, maybe before it, that was all people did, looking at it like some sort of language game or whatever. Mm -hmm. But do you think that there is any loss of not doing that that much anymore? Or do you think philosophers do that sufficiently? Oh, a really interesting question. Um, I think there's a role for social anthropology, right? right. And sociology of religion, I think, um, that we probably need to take more seriously, just to understand um, the n nature and character of religious forms um, in different contexts and, and cultures and so on. Um, but um, I'm, I'm pretty pleased with a great deal of what's going on in contemporary philosophical theology, but I do have concerns. I think okay. there are concerns. They're maybe not the concerns that you uh, just have uh, mentioned. <laughs> um, I think one, one danger, um, in contemporary um, philosoph um, philosophical theology or philosophy of religion, is that we can seek to determine a priori the way God must necessarily be, the, na the, 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 the way knowing must necessarily be, and then seek to um, accommodate 
Christian resources within what constitutes a Procrustean bed. You know, a Procrustean right, bed yes. where you cut off the legs that the knee used to fit, and so the um, phenomenon you're uh, um, considering um, fits the predetermined container, right? Or predetermined categories. And that's one of the temptations that we've got to resist. And one of the admirable things of, of features of the work of people like um, Mike Ray, uh, Mel Pandiga, and Peter Van Inwagen is they're serious Christians and are determined at every point to ensure that they're not predetermining and predefining um, the way Christian thought must necessarily look and seeking to interpret the um, Christian thought out of its own resources, but to do so with analytic rigor. So I hope this isn't an unduly provocative question, but following up in some ways on what you've just been talking about. Um, within what you're talking about, with respect to one of the potential pitfalls of analytic philosophical theology, um, what's your take on so-called perfect being theology as, as methodology within analytic theology? Oh, great question, Kevin. You read my mind. Um, um, there's some very interesting work and very significant work um, being done on perfect being theology, mm -hmm. which is very useful and very useful to engage with. Mm -hmm. But put it this way, f f as, a, as a Christian theologian, it's categorically clear to me that it's imperative that the direction of the pressure of interpretation when it comes to the doctrine of God, mm -hmm. the direction of the pressure of interpretation must be from God's self-disclosure mm -hmm. mm -hmm. as Jesus Christ and by <coughs> the Spirit. Um, and not from um, some kind of predetermination mm -hmm. of the way God must necessarily be. So what would it look like to do perfect being theology uh, from that direction? Is it possible to do perfect being theology that doesn't involve consulting intuitions about uh, great making properties and so forth prior to talking about uh, divine self-revelation? I would take a look and see, okay. a look and see approach. Um, Let's just look at what perfect being um, um, theologians and philosophers are coming up with, mm -hmm. and then let's just ask, to what extent does that fit? Or to what extent does that sure. cast constructive light mm -hmm. on the right. Christian resources? Right. If it can cast constructive light on these, right. Good. where's the problem? If it becomes a Procrustean bed, mm -hmm. then, then we have to ask some serious questions right. about whether their, whether their vision might be actually limited, mm -hmm. might be, you know, um, yeah, and, and surely in, in uh, analytic theology, uh, although there is some attention, I think there isn't enough attention for things like God's emotions, like anger and, you know, that you see in scripture. And that, I think, would be very interesting to, to look at philosophically. So what, what would you say? I mean, how, how would we approach that? Now, there is a really good question. Um, it raises so many issues, all right, obviously about divine attributes, but also how we understand, approach um, religious language. Kevin, you got views on this. In fact, maybe you, you, you could answer this. I'm but happy to be instructed by you. As you, <laughs> <laughs> as you know, the, the Bible is full of claims about God um, that um, attribute emotions of various kinds. To God. But yet at the same time, make it clear that there is um, a radical discontinuity between um, the being of God and contingent creatures. And so that raises the question, of course, of analogy and how um, we've to, we're to view um, the attribution of emotions to God. We've got to, fi um, we've got to find a constructive way between um, being anthropomorphic, just projecting human properties in some kind of crude way onto the being of God, and being agnostic, where we say there's no, discontinu there's no continuity whatsoever, between the language used of God and the language used of the contingent order. And to my mind, the, the, the critical control on the process is the incarnation. Mm -hmm. Because here we have right. God come, not, not in a man, but as human, as human being. And, um, and if we take the hypostatic union seriously, I think we've got grounds for um, a thoroughly constructive vision of analogy. It's interesting, a lot of people trace analogy tend to assume that analogy, that analogy debates trace back to um, um, Thomas Aquinas. Right. The person who used, who wrote, I think, with spectacular cogency on analogy was, of course, Athanasius. And he saw, he, he said that the condition for 
um, theologine or analogine was his expression, um, as opposed to mythology, mythologine, mm -hmm. was the twofold homoousion, <coughs> that the incarnate son is of one being with the father, right, and recognized by the spirit who is of one being with the father. And that facilitates the possibility of theological reference and the use of human language of God that refers, um, as he says, alithos, truly and appropriately, um, without being mythological or anthropomorphic. Kevin, you've, you, you've written a lot on this topic. Well, it actually made me think about um, in Athanasius as a, a sort of slogan for one of the things you were saying earlier. Athanasius has this great line against the Arians, yes. better to name God or better to name divinity from the Son and call him Father than to name God from uh, creation and call, call divinity uncreatedness or unbegottenness, right? Where uh, rather than having intuitions about what divinity should be like, namely divinity should be unbegotten, right? Or uh, ingenerateness or any of these, better to name God from the Son and call him Father, which strikes me as uh, right in line with what you're Same. suggesting. Uh, one of the things that occurred to me as you were talking is that your answer was an example of the sort of thing I'd like to hear more from you about. So um, you've talked about how philosophers help you um, shed light on certain theological topics and so forth. Uh, do you think there are things that philosophers could stand to learn from theologians? Uh, persons who are doing analytic philosophy of religion, for instance. That's a great question. And Kevin, let me put the throw that back at you. Because you've thought a lot about this. Uh, let's hear from you on that topic. Uh, well, that's good. I was prepared just to hear your answer. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, I think that um, one thing that theologians, by and large, these generalizations are going to be um, sketchy around the edges, but um, theologians, by and large, are more alert to or in tune with context. Uh, thinking about the context of ideas, the context of theologians themselves and so forth, in ways that analytic philosophers, I mean, I think part of the charm of analytic philosophy, but it can become a danger, is uh, this sort of insistence on not respecting persons, right? That the only thing that counts is the argument. There's something, I think, charming about that, right? If it's a good argument, it's a good argument, irrespective of who says it, irrespective of when it's said and so forth. But having said that, um, you can miss out on a lot of contextually, hermeneutically, politically important factors. Uh, and I think that there's a danger of that, right? And so uh, I think the way that theologians characteristically uh, attend to history, the history of doctrine, the history of ideas and so forth, and in, you know, the movements in contextual theologies of various sorts, I think there's uh, a, a fulsome recognition of how important it is uh, for one to attend to where one is coming at these things from. Uh, and I think that's something that, that theologians can uh, maybe help analytic philosophers of religion with. I mean, I think that's just one example. Sorry. Helen, you might have some. Yeah, yeah I, I think that, that the, the danger is in philosophy, this is not particular for analytic philosophy of religion, but actually for most analytic philosophy, is this idea that the view from nowhere, mm -hmm. that, that by just rigorous argumentation, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter that we live in 21st century, that we're mostly Westerners, mm -hmm. mostly men. I mean, that all doesn't matter. It's sort of like you have this idea about Descartes who sort of went into his room with a hot stove mm -hmm. and he came up with this whole new idea of, sort of mm -hmm. you know, questioning everything he learns right. in childhood. Right. And even though we don't think as philosophers anymore that that's realistic, mm -hmm. it's still a sort of ideal. Mm -hmm. But the danger is that you just become blind to all the context that is around you mm -hmm. by, by not acknowledging it. Mm -hmm. you, you can let it bias your work right. in an undue way. Right. No, that's a good point. And so what one of the things we need theologians, philosophers alike, I think, is a model of rigor that pushes us to be disciplined in the things that uh, we're trying to think carefully about such that we don't bring in all kinds of extraneous factors about whether we like the person who said it and so forth. Right. But having said that, to be really exactingly careful about the things we're considering without then blinkering ourselves to some of these other things, right? And coming up with a model according to which it's just me and ideas and uh, I'm just thinking hard about them. There's no additional context that needs to be considered. But this is just one example. I mean, I think there are probably uh, others, and I'm, I'd be eager to hear from either of you mm -hmm. about uh, 
Ironically, um, one of the refreshing features of the Christian analytic philosophers, like for example Alvin Plantinga, is the extent to which he repudiates a, 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 an old-fashioned view of, of reason as operating from some kind of Archimedean right, point. Right, 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 right. Well, our planning argues, um, demonstrates, I think, su supremely well the extent to which reason always operates from an epistemic base, from a series of suppositions, mm -hmm. and so on. And um, reason in and of itself, just pure reason, can't demonstrate anything that very much at all, mm -hmm. anything that's particularly useful. Um, now, of course, that doesn't mean that everything requires to be relativized. It's really important that we don't you know, get confused here. But um, I think there's a, I think in non-philosophical non circles, there's a slightly, um, there's a, a myth that philosophers think they occupy some Archimedean city. And mm -hmm. I, I don't, the, the, the philosophical theologians that I'm engaged with now, I just don't, don't seem to think in that way. In a recent seminar, we read Plantinga's Warranted Christian Belief. Yeah. And uh, several of my students, their reaction was, uh, that they, they read that as, in some ways, almost uh, an importantly transitional point in the argument where he recognizes the particularity of uh, particular religion and particular uh, basic beliefs, but not the ways in which there might be other particular aspects of uh, his identity and who he is and where he's situated historically that might also be relevant that, uh, at the very least, maybe should be considered, but thinking that planting his own views would press in that direction, right? So thinking that this is helpful in pressing in certain of these directions, but thinking that planting himself in his explication of his views doesn't uh, go far enough in that direction. This is tying back with uh, what you were saying earlier. Mm. And it, yes, and, and actually a point you made earlier, Helen, um, um, again, bears on this. I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a Presbyterian Christian. I was born in Scotland, clearly, there's a connection between that. Had I been born, <laughs> I'd, I'd been born in, um, in northern Thailand, I'd probably be terrified, of, I'd almost certainly be terrified of Buddhists and so on and so forth. Had I been born in certain parts of India, um, you know, I might be um, um, Muslim or, or Hindu or whatever. Um, and so the challenge, the challenge is this. Mm -hmm. Are we simply going to say that our views are simply the product of our geographical location, mm -hmm. right? Now, um, we've got to take that contextuality seriously. Yeah, this is a big problem. In so this is, again, not specific to philosophy of religion, but this is a big problem now in epistemology, is the problem of irrelevant influences. Because, in fact, had you been born in Thailand, you wouldn't have the, the, a lot of other beliefs, you know, political and, and ethical. Mm -hmm. You would have very different ethical beliefs. It's so not just question of religious beliefs. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so, so that's, that's a big big worry. Some people have said that it isn't exactly a worry because it would pervade so everything and to that extent that you would say, okay, even, you know, disregarding the, the, the accident of my birth, mm. if I can have good reasons and arguments to support the things that I believe, it's, it's not that big a worry because otherwise the worry is going to be spreading to everything. So that's one, one epistemological solution to that problem. Mm. Not terribly satisfying, maybe. But, but the, the exciting thing is the extent to which it's, it, the, it, the spotlight is now on the truth, on the truth question. Right. Yeah. And um, because um, unless we're going to be um, anti-realists and hoisting our own petard, um, um, or confused pluralists or in, uh, inclusivists, and you know, pluralism is in, inclusivism reposes on exclusive truth claims. So there, there's no, there's not an option there. Right, what we just right. simply got to face, uh, face up to is the fact that different people from different contexts make diverse, exclusive truth claims. Mm -hmm. And what we've got to try and do is work out which are true. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the, again, one of the exciting things about development, Gavin de Costa, also Peter Van der Wagen and Al Panigas material on, on pluralism and so on, is that we can't escape um, engagement with the truth question. So I think um, we look at Alan Torrance's claims which have emerged within, you know, Calvinist Scotland, mm -hmm. and we look at um, Joe Bloggs or Joanna Bloggs claims that have emerged in in, in Thailand, um, and we simply try to work out what the critical criteria are, the controls are, the epistemology, mm -hmm. and, and and the warrant for those claims, mm -hmm. and try and work out what is tr what is true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and that's, I think that's what we're all, all involved in.